Yeah, welcome back everyone for High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have lecture 10. It is about parallel and scalable machine and deep learning. So this is a very popular topic right now in high performance computing. And it's the first lecture that really dives a little bit more into the application field of HPC. So we see in the subsequent lectures now much more using HPC techniques than rather introducing, let's say, new techniques that you have already learned in the couple of lectures before. So you know about MPI, OpenMP, you know about GPUs, accelerators, the difference between multi-core and many-core chips. And especially here in, in many-core makes a big difference in deep learning. And we will see this with a couple of invited lectures that are following to this, let's say, introductionary lecture 10, when we start with a general understanding, really, what is machine learning before we then go into the idea of what is a parallel and scalable way of doing machine learning and then ending up with basically deep learning with two invited lectures that then will cover a little bit material of why many core is there so important, why accelerators are used, why we can do distributed training um, by really using then different GPUs together. But we built this gradually in lecture 10, which has also two practical lectures this time. And we start a little bit with a recap what we had the last time. And we discussed a little bit about high performance computing and the top 500 before. So you know uh, the most powerful computers that are in the world and we know of, they are basically in this list called top 500, which is essentially compiled twice a year and it really ranks all the different computers in terms of how many cores they have, how many power they require. Uh, interesting, of course, for us is these days that almost all elements of these lists have accelerators. And this was a topic of lecture nine, if you remember, really thinking a little bit more how you program accelerators, why GPUs are so relevant, and what does it really mean to have GPUs in high performance computing because of course we know from the tradition of GPUs they have been just in basically um, small computers for game players. So here we talk more about general purpose graphical processing units and you can see very well that um, number two in the world here is a summit system and you see the architecture around here where the multi-core systems um, basically or multi-core chips are, the caches are and then attached to those nodes, you have also the GPUs. And interestingly enough, you have here basically these two nodes and six, basically um, six GPUs attached to this node. And this is a lot for a compute node. And uh, basically you see also um, what we do in Europe here, the Juvel system we also had already in one of the lectures. Um, we talked about, okay, it is also fueled by NVIDIA but also by the most cutting edge A100 GPU, which is the Ampere. And we discussed also that there's huge differences when you think about the architectures of NVIDIA graphic cards. We started with a long time ago, maybe with Pascal coming over to Kepler um, and, and then having Volta. And now we have basically Ampere. Of course, still using, let's say, GPUs, also the older versions is still relevant. They're still here and they're much more powerful than you would compute it with a typical multi-core uh, CPU, because essentially the idea was, if you remember from the last time, really have lots of throughput that you see essentially a little bit explained here. Um, you still have to have the host CPU, as we discussed, because every time you see this processing flow here, we go from the CPU, meaning the host CPU, to the accelerator, to the GPU, and then back with the results of the CPU. So you really have to transfer the data firstly into the GPU that you see here. And then you see the lots of different small cores here where we discussed that these have not high single thread performance like a CPU. This is just really moderate um, thread performance, but then you have actually processors here on the thousands. And this of course enables you high throughput. So each task might be not the really number crunching task, but it could be a very trivial task 
um, like we have seen with multi matrix multiplication, for example, which will also be relevant in neural networks and deep learning in this lecture and also in the subsequent practical lectures. So once you have done this and have actually put from the CPU memory the data into the memory from the GPU here, you can compute uh, on a very, let's say, high throughput manner. And then when you're done, you basically have to get the results back to the host CPU in order to do something with it, drop it to disk, or basically analyze it maybe with another idea of um, basically using different data sets. So of course, it's a very general structure. We see more and more that there's also different types of accelerators coming. So this will be an interesting time where CUDA, which you see language for NVIDIA, for instance, will be not anymore the only one how you program GPUs and accelerators. So we see today we have basically OpenEC, which is inspired by OpenMP if you want. Also, we have HIP as another programming paradigm. And despite the fact that many of these systems are still NVIDIA powered, right? So this includes the Celine, the NVIDIA system itself here, which is one of the highest ranked here. But also you see that Juvels is counting on NVIDIA with A100 GPUs, just four by node. And also the Summit system has NVIDIA graphic cards, essentially um, in basically six per node. And then many different nodes uh, available. So in a way that's really captures the main essence of lecture nine. Um, of course, we left a little bit out why they're so successful in, let's say today, HPC, why they are so successful in deep learning. And this is something what we want to basically come with these couple of lectures as part of the lecture 10. So we are, as I said earlier already now, diving a little bit more in the application fields now. So we have seen many fundamentals in HPC. You have done domain decompositions in HPC. We talked about programming techniques like MPI, how you can make parallel algorithms, how you do hybrid parallel algorithms with MPI and OpenMP combined. And then from the more practical perspective, thinking how you can improve your performance. We did performance analysis and then really motivated that the multi-core error uh, was very important, but the many core error now really shakes up the HPC environments, the systems and uh, programming as well. So, and this has a very big put footprint, especially in deep learning these days. And that's why in lecture 10, we'll discuss this gradually. However, of course, um, it's clear that everybody of you has not a very sound machine learning background. And this course here is a high performance course, and it's not really a machine learning course yet. I want to bring across a couple of elements um, for machine learning. So we will dive in the first part of the lecture here now in some fundamentals. So what is machine learning? What learning methods do we have at our disposal? What is the difference between classification, clustering? And then we will introduce a little bit uh, the simplest uh, learning model, if you want. It's called a linear perceptual model. It's in the realm of linear learning models. Admittedly, a very trivial model, but it's one of the oldest model and still give, still give rise to the idea of how we actually do deep learning today. So essentially it models a little bit a neuron and deep learning networks today are basically based on lots of neurons you interconnect with very smart ideas. So hence we go to some basics here. And one of the basics is also to understand the different processes like training, testing, uh, why we have a training set, why we have a testing set. And we'll do also some application examples here, of course, when you think about a simple binary classification. So you just have two classes here. Also this we extend gradually then from lecture 10 to practical lecture 10.1 or practical lecture 10.2. But at least it gives you, let's say, a very warm start to machine learning. Of course, it cannot capture a whole machine learning course and that's not the aim. That's why in the second part of the lecture, we immediately also will shed some light on algorithms that are already in parallel and doing machine learning. We have here a support vector machine MPI implementation. We will look briefly how that is used with remote sensing applications, but also then we'll review a little bit where the pitfalls are and coming a bit back what we had already in the benchmarking and performance analysis lecture, but also reviewing that this is a very scalable approach 
and a machine learning technique which is quite robust because you have just essentially a couple of parameters, uh, maybe a kernel parameter and then some cost parameter to enable some error or to allow some error to happen. Of course, these things are not clear for you. We see how that materialized when we come to the second part of the lecture, where we then really want to discuss why we need parallel computing. Why is high performance computing these days with AI so intertwined? So we will review a bit the computing footprint in this. So where is training, testing, validation with respect to the computing needs, the requirements of basically also the data sets, not always, it is maybe about more computing power. It could be also about memory, about storage. And we will basically motivate then that the com computing demands for deep learning are incredible these days. And that's why high performance is really fueled, uh, is, is really fueling deep learning today. Also, we will discuss that even if you have GPUs at your disposal, um, interconnecting GPUs for distributed training also makes sense. There will be a whole practical lecture, uh, invited practical lecture about it. So I will not really go into all the deep details there, just pointing to some pointers uh, to the subsequent lectures. And then at the end of the lecture, we will review again the HPDB scan algorithm, uh, which is then an algorithm in a different realm of machine learning, which we come to as clustering. And this is one what you already a little bit know now from many of the lectures. So also here, we don't spend much time just to understand it a bit more to see and put it in the computing, uh, let's say, footprint perspective as part of this lecture. We pointed to this lecture many times. So you see here on this side, we fulfill many promises of previous lectures. And from the learning outcomes, you will learn much more about domain decomposition and, of course, already really foundations approaches for various different scientific domains today you will nearly find no scientific domain that not takes advantage of machine learning or deep learning in one way or another. So you really can say that basically this is a very important skill set to think about machine learning. There are lots of jobs outside, which might be also interesting for you as students. And in this sense, it's also very good to at least know the foundations, know the basics, how you do machine learning. And then when you get interested, you can, of course, take a machine learning course and then learn much more about the principles of machine learning, statistical learning theory would be one of it, why we generalize. Um, but of course, you also will have in the back of your mind always you can basically speed up a lot of computing in the machine learning world, which is often not part of a machine learning course. So essentially, this is quite complementary. When we talk about machine learning fundamentals, we have to basically get a little bit of an overview of what's, what's existing in terms of methods, in terms of models. So one way to essentially group this a little bit, while they're not directly, strictly boundaries always, um, is these kind of three different areas. We would have classification here on the left, where essentially, you know already there's a group of data that exists, and we will focus in this lecture very much on it to really understand the principles of machine learning much better. You would have these groups of data existing, and then you would come with a new data item, and you want to know automatically is it the green or the red group? And this automatically is loaded. This should be basically a artificial intelligence, machine learning model telling you this. So of course, sometimes scientific expert or experts that know about the data, they could judge it themselves. But of course, here the point is in machine learning to automate the process. Hence, here we're searching for some rule, some model that really will take the new data and will basically classify it in one or the other um, group. Now, there's another area, a large area called clustering, which is also reaching into the field of data mining. Hence, you will know from previous lectures, um, data mining, signal processing, machine learning, statistical learning, uh, statistics, they're all overlapping. They have really common ideas. Car means clustering, DB scan clustering can be seen as machine learning, but many will also see it as data mining. So in the end, that doesn't matter for us as data scientists. We would just take whatever we have in our toolbox to think about how we can solve a problem. And clustering largely means that you would have a meaning of thinking about two different clusters of data here, but it's not for certain like in the classes, right? So here you would have something that tells you that might be one class and that's another. And for you, you see that already, although we don't have the colors, we can see a little bit the similarity measure 
when we take maybe the Euclidean distance between the points here and the Euclidean distance, which is a ruler distance, indeed, basically just between these points. And you see that they kind of form two clusters. They are closer together and they are closer together. And this is the essence of clustering. Hence, of course, um, there are some statistical areas also where regression makes sense. Regression is a word which usually stands for real valued output. So an example you see here is a certain slope where you would put in, let's say, some money. And basically, you want to see for TV ads how much money gives you then new sales of your products. So this reaches also to the idea of statistical analysis. And although we will have logistic regression today for classification, um, this is meant a little bit different. Of course, these techniques behind it, the optimization behind it, are partly very much similar, but this would be requiring then also more detailed courses to go into the details. So in a way, you can basically group the machine learning models that way. And uh, when we dive now a little bit into the classification, as we said in this part of the lecture, as at least at the beginning, we would say um, and pick a specific idea of classification where we talk about supervised learning. Um, this means that essentially for every input data, we would have someone already labeled it for us, right? So if you remember, as the example here, we would have here X, which is really all the points and their location, let's say in the space. And we have also a, a basically associated Y. It gives us essentially then the labels of all these points, right? And of course, um, think about that this is of course always a vector, uh, essentially representing a multidimensional point, right? So for each point, essentially up to N data points we have, we have an associated label telling you it's a red or green point. And this is something what we call a two class problems because essentially you have just one class and another. Of course, here again, the idea is that this could be multidimensional and we will see in the subsequent practical lecture 10.1 and 10.2 that we have there basically classification tasks of up to 50 classes that you want to differentiate. It gets much more complicated. Hence, the computing footprint is also bigger. And supervised in the end means then nothing else and a supervisor is helping you out, essentially saying you have always this guiding output that helps, of course, to get basically a model done in the area. What we want to do with it is essentially these two areas. You would say you want to predict a certain, let's say, idea of future points. So you want to predict is this, let's say, um, data point, perhaps uh, the red or the green button, and inference is also used to basically have then a better understanding of the relationships. But supervised learning is really characterized um, to have always this idea, and this is how you know it, that it is a supervised problem. You would have the data as input, but also always a correct output alongside. So this helps us, of course, to create it. And when you think about machine learning now, um, when you have this data available, um, you basically have kind of three prerequisites you should always check. The first is also that, is there something in the data that could be a pattern, right? If there are no pattern, then there's nothing to look for, like a, let's say, random number generator that makes no sense to really learn it. Equally, if we have an exact mathematical or physical formula of the problem we want to learn, like we know that a little bit from weather forecasts, there are basically already a numerical method based on known physical laws, there you don't really would consider necessarily machine learning. You can still do it, but the question is if it would be better than the mathematical or physical formula. And then, of course, the third is a key ingredient in machine learning. Uh, you need to have the data. Machine learning uh, translated in another way means learning from data. And this is very clear. And basically there, of course, there comes now the, the idea of why HPC could be relevant because we see that more and more data is generated these days. We see sensors with an unbelievable high resolutions producing big data sets. We see more sharing among the communities. In health, in basically something which you also see in one of the next lectures coming, lecture 11, uh, you will see that also there in the human brain, there are basically lots of image uh, analysis questions that are big data problems. So you talk about terabits, terabytes of brains you want to analyze, not anymore a couple of gigabytes of data. So here you see already that the data is often complete. It is really large data sets, large quantities of data. 
And that always means essentially we have to think about some form of computing. And this is these days shared among many disciplines, applied statistics, data mining, machine learning, especially in, in deep learning, you will find that people really need to consider high performance computing and GPUs. And there's a new form of, let's say, word coined in the last 10 years around basically this overlap that in a sense also require cutting edge machine learning, but also statistics and data mining techniques called data science, which is a basically interesting area today because also masters are created for that. Um, we have also specialization of data science essentially in one of our bachelors. So when we now want to understand machine learning step by step, I provide you here with a very simple tutorial. I have shown many times and got very good feedback from many different, um, let's say, uh, perspective, even if it's cutting edge scientists that never touched machine learning up to students in basically the bachelor area. So this is something where you can really step by step now understand machine learning even if it's a trivial model, a very simple model, it captures the essence of uh, any classification task you will in endeavor. We start essentially by the problem of saying again, um, we want to classif classify a flower. So in a sense, we want to classify some groups of data. And you see we characterize these groups of data, the red and the green here, by one type of flower called Irisitosa and another one called Iris virginica. And already from the images, you can kind of yeah, realize that they are very close in terms of similarity, right? So it's for us as, let's say, not biological expert or plant experts, not particularly clear if this new flower here, this is an unseen example, as we call, but this is what we want to know. We know that these are Iris hitosa. We know that these are Iris virginica. But the question is now, and this is again this data point in an example, what type of flower is this? And now maybe plant experts could immediately tell, of course, that's the point, but even they would benefit if they would have an automated process. If you think about going through a field with maybe thousand flowers, then you don't want to make a picture of all the thousand flowers and then analyze them manually. You probably want to have an AI model or a machine learning model to help you classify this problem. So here we have the ingredients. Groups of data exists, you know that, and the new data to be classified from this existing group. So we need essentially a model we train, we create from these existing knowledge we have in order to be, let's say, fit to understand what basically this flower might characterize. So this is a learning problem called a prediction task. We want to know what this type of flower is. Um, of course, it's a binary classification problem. It has just two classes here. And now the question is, when you want to go further, what in this flower here would be attributes, features, something about this flower that you would like to think about, which could differentiate the virginica from the setosa? And this is something where we have to think about. And then you come immediately to something that the experts would call a sepal and a petal of the flower. And indeed, when you have this data available, I give you here the example again from the ingredients or the requirements you should check. Um, I said the first was always some pattern exists. So there seems to be a pattern there. We know that these two flower types are somehow can be put into groups, but we don't know really what the pattern is. Also, to the best of our knowledge, nobody has really done a physical or mathematical proof of a formula that actually then put these two in different classes. And the third ingredient is that we have this data that is existing. It's a UCI machine learning repository for learning, especially for students. It's really something I would recommend when you're interested in the field to look at. And this is called the IRIS data set. Now, it has 150 labeled samples and 50 samples per class which tells you now immediately that this is not a two class problem here. It's a three class problem. And uh, basically I subsampled, as we call it, just two classes out here, the Zetosa and the Virginica, just to make a certain point here for machine learning. The third class is a bit more complicated and requires more a machine learning course of basically data that is not any more linearly separable. And it would be going a bit too far in this class. But you see here also the attributes we're talking about. So the first four, of course, are directly attributes about the flower. So this is a vector X, as we know, with different, let's say, values. 
But as we also said, as a supervised problem, we don't have only vector x. We have also this given y, which is then the class representation as it is a Setosa or Virginica. Of course, then we want to learn this for future data. So we want to start to get understand how can we do this? How can we differentiate? And the interesting thing is if you plot it here, um, this is a pure plotting of the data, right? So we just know from the petal length and the petal width, we skip a little bit the sepal. So basically we just have these two attributes and if we point them, we already see a pattern emerging, right? So it seems to be something with the sizes of the petal length and the petal width. So in a sense, we already see two clusters um, emerging here. And we have 100 of those, so it is quite actually eminent, right? If we would have just a couple of points, it would be still perhaps not certain. But here we are most likely very certain that there must be somewhere a line here that you can draw to think about um, that everything above this line might be probably a petal length, uh, uh, kind of iris virginica and the other one iris uh, setosa. So in the end, um, this gives us a good idea of when we want to color them, that we basically have also the supervised approach. In other words, um, here we see we now use the same data we just plotted and give them the class representation. So again, this is the iris setosa, the green group, and we have here the red or orange group is iris virginica. So all we did right now was just, you know, plotting it. So there's absolutely no machine learning so far. But machine learning often starts exactly with this. You have to understand your data set. You have to understand essentially the characterization of the data. Of course, this is a very simple problem, just two dimensional. But now the question really comes, is there some line which we basically call a decision boundary in machine learning, a very important terminology. The decision boundary will determine, is this everything above it, iris virginica, or everything below it, maybe iris cetosa? And you want to have this line, of course, as best as possible, right? So basically making the line maybe here, directly at the data might be not the best solution. And directly here at the data must be not the best solution. So there are different algorithms that solve that problem. We will have a very simple algorithm called the linear perceptron model, while they're also very um, uh, sweet material like support vector machines that really find the best possible line in between. But we start here with a very simple example called essentially then the perceptron learning model. And before we go there, let us review what we mean by a line. I mean, this is basically more or less simple mathematics. You know here, essentially a line can be a little bit written like this formula here. Um, the interesting thing is would be, of course, is WI, which means essentially the orientation of the line um, that we will have, right? It determines given X because that's something what we have in the data set. And you basically would, um, you know, sum this up linearly using weights. And every time it's above a certain threshold, you would say, okay, this is essentially the virginica. If it's below a certain threshold, then it's the setosa. For mathematical convenience, you can also put that a little bit more in a, let's say, compact representation with the minus here and say the threshold needs to be learned as well. And there you basically have your um, e equation, essentially, how you can characterize this line, although we don't know the line yet. All we have are x and, of course, the y that will help us later. So basically, we want to understand then with the sign uh, something like minus one or plus one. So plus one might be virginica and minus one is irisitosa. That's why we put it in the sign function. And basically, if you do this a little bit more, uh, let's say in a principled way, you clearly end up here to something called the perceptron model. And this is really an interesting model because it goes back to the 1957, you know, to the very long time ago, where this was one of the first learning model, if not the first mod learning model around, and actually modeled according to the neurons. And if you remember basically a little bit or heard before how we essentially learn in the human brain, it is like a signal processing. It's a signal that comes in every time. And I have my neuron here. And what I learn really is a strength by repeated stimulation 
always about the neuron. And this is a called training phase, right? And essentially, you see here how the perceptual mo learning model looks like. You have the input X. These are constants for us because that's our data set. And you have basically something to check if it's really you know, working with the given output Y. This is also constant. It's also in our data set. So all you want to have to learn is really these weights. So X times W summed up linear using weights here, adding this bias, which represent the threshold here. And then you put it through an activation function and having then essentially something that equals the given Y or not. And this is how you can learn. If it's not essentially like the Y you want, you have to go back and do this incredibly often again and again. And then you will see that this weights will adjust themselves. However, you see also here that this is just a model. So there is no recipe still how to find the weights, right? And we come to this that to every learning model we have, there is also an algorithm that trains it. So for the perceptron learning model, we have the perceptron learning algorithm. For support vector machines, we have quadratic programming. For neural networks, you would have backpropagation. So all of these models in machine learning have also an associated learning algorithm, and all of them somehow are related to the fact that they need to learn certain weights or certain, let's say, elements in the KI model. So here's an example that this really works. So you can see here, uh, basically, a uh, kind of example in the table and assuming that there was a training phase and came up with this interesting certain weights and this bias, um, you essentially have a trained perceptual model that actually represent this data set. So every time you pick some data, like you see here, you can put it in, you know, you have the weights time the data set and then summed up linearly using weights, you achieve something which then can be put through the sign function. That's important, right? So basically something here maybe which is bigger than zero. When you consider example three here with one, one and zero for X3, then essentially you end up with plus one. If you take sample six as an example, you have essentially something like minus 0 0.1 coming out of this. If you summed up linearly, then you have minus one. And this tells you the class already essentially now, and it will fit the given label Y as well with minus one and of course plus one. So this is really the simplest idea how you could do this. And the way how it is done is essentially then using uh, the so-called learning, or uh, basically perceptual learning algorithm. So in a way, you would have here the same idea of the function that we already here have. We call that a hypothesis of a certain vector x that you give as input that you then can check with your guiding output y. And what it means to change the hypothesis here, that's why it's in red, it really means to change the weights, including the bias or the threshold. And if you want to see that graphically, you see that here essentially in these different lines. Of course, you can space, you can divide the space differently right, using this red line. And the algorithm will play around with this line until essentially of basically there are less um, errors when you really consider that these points should be correctly classified with the colors. It also tells you that we have very many of those. So this is a hypothesis set and the hypothesis that actually is belonging to a huge set of hypotheses, which are all characterizing here in this example by very many different lines that are going through this and actually would classify the data correctly. So playing with this decision boundary is now something what the learning algorithm have to do. And there's an idea, of course, that you can um, here for mathematical convenience further reduce it. We have reduced it here by saying the threshold is nothing else than another weight you want to learn, uh, basically, and always put one here. Then essentially you can simplify this a little bit and say, um, you can do this in a vector notation using a transpose here, which is then really the most compact notation you in a way can find, W transpose X, uh, which no, nothing else is written here. It's just more conveniently written that this vector of the weights, right, for every X is then basically um, transposed. So basically formed into a column vector here and then multiplied by the traditional data set. Still, the W is a big question, the red thing here. So what are the values of this? And 
This is something where we now come to the algorithm idea itself. Um, the perceptual learning algorithm I show you here in a couple of steps is a very trivial algorithm. It's not proof to converge if you, for instance, have, let's say, non linearable data. So here we really require that the classes are uh, different and not intertwined, not really connected to each other. And how it works is you would pick just one of the points and you put it through the equation or basically through this W transpose X uh, with some initial values of W, how you initialize them is a tricky question. Here and there, um, there are some specific recipes or recommendations how you could do it, but assume you basically do this randomly, you still can show that after doing this a long time, and then basically that if your data set is linearly separable, then it actually converges. And every time you would one, pick one point at a time, you put it through the equation and you will see what happened to your guiding output Y. This is also a constant, it's in your data set. You can always see if your current weight is in line what you have here in your associated label. That makes it supervised, right? So, and if not, then you have to do something. Um, and of course, if you pick all the points and all of them are correctly classified, then you're done. But uh, basically, you will find that many, many times you firstly have to run it through and you will see there should be additions. And by basically going through this um, update rule you have here, depending on if the class is minus one or plus one, you would do this update rule of saying the weight is actually what was the weight, but then uh, actually added to the multiplication of your weights or uh, of your given uh, basically label to the data set you have for the vector X. Um, it is visually explained a little bit as adding or subtracting a vector, right? Depending again on your given output Y here. Um, and then with this, you play around with W, but of course it is a very drastic change. If you think about the vector orientation, minus one and plus one, adding, subtracting vectors. So you can imagine a bit here, what is explained here in the visualization, that this is quite a hectic process, but the good news is even if it is a hectic process, you see over time the error gets smaller and actually is now converging. And this is the line that separates the red from the blue. And this could be many different iterations. And let's say if there's only one point here in the space of blue that would be red, it would be not converging. You would have one line, but um, this would be not the line that really works. So here again, this means it is linearly separable because no blue point is in the red space and equally no red point is in the blue space. They're just close to each other, which is fine, but nobody's really crossing this boundary, which is an important part for this. Now, coming back to our flower problem, we now know essentially how we can compute this decision boundary. Um, that is exactly what we have chosen and seen here. So we have to do nothing else than putting it to this, let's say, linear function. Uh, we take the sign of it and compare it always with our given output. Is it Erisitosa or is it Virginica? And when I do this now a hundred times, a thousand times, and we see here the data is linearly separable. So there will be one line found that actually is or can be used then for the um, decision boundary in any time you have some, let's say, flower, you can measure the attributes and say, oh, is it a Citosa or a Virginica and put it through the function that will basically give you then the result automatically. So this was admittedly a very simple machine learning problem, um, essentially binary classification around flowers. Now, of course, you want to, un to think about also other application domains. Here's, for instance, an example where something like this can be used. We do this in the cloud computing course much more intensively, but there we use also, for instance, text information. So text can be actually transformed to mathematical values. And there we can basically use, for instance, the rating about restaurants or let's say quality violations in restaurants. So about cleanliness and something like this and food inspection problems. So th this is an application domain just for an example, right? So that means also it does not be always images. It can be text that actually is fueled by or basically can be given into machine learning algorithms. And then what you want to know just by all the violations of this, by checking the restaurant, will it in the future actually fail or pass the food inspection? And this is 
also binary classification. It's a different type of binary classification, different data set, different application problem. But in a way, you can also use the same algorithms uh, and the linear learning model we just have seen. We know also there might be a pattern when there are too many quality violations. There's a highly likelihood that probably we have an inspection that fails. On the other hand, we have probably a pass if there are almost no quality violations. So in the end, you think there's a pattern. But there's also no mathematical formula that we know in this area. And in this data set, we find lots of text information about basically um, these uh, quality uh, reviews of these restaurants. And with this, you can create a model out of this data that can predict if basically one of these restaurants will actually pass or fail a food inspection. Another example, as I said earlier in our complementary cloud computing course, we use this much more intensively. And I want to close a little bit the first part with a, with a bit bigger picture of linear learning models. Because what you just have seen, that was linear classification in a simple binary classification forms. It was a linear separable problem. We adjust the weights uh, basically by summing up them linearly using weights. And they remain in the linear um, space because of this. So essentially, we're still using a linear way of combining all the inputs with the weights. So linear regression then is, let's say, a bit different. It is essentially a real value idea of saying, not a classification task of sort, is give you a real value of saying um, how much sales, for instance, you can get if you spend a certain money budget. But it goes and along the lines of very similar ideas um, it's also a linear learning model. And then when you want to use something for, let's say, um, classification purpose, which is cutting edge, for instance, what you have seen in the food inspection in the cloud course, we use a logistic regression for it. Um, there you basically have uh, essentially um, basically the idea of a real value as well, because it's called regression. That means a real value. But we put it through a certain function that you see here which then uh, squeezes every value you have essentially between zero and one. And from this, you can have a binary outcome again of your classification. And the interesting thing, it's starting to have nonlinear data, data, uh, data dependencies catched um, by using the sigmoid function, still having a binary problem of squashing here basically everything between zero and one. And this could be, for instance, a pass and fail. However, the idea of this lecture is essentially not to give you, um, you know, all the details in machine learning. As I said, this was really a very simple introduction to machine learning with a view also for a second part now, which will capture much more um, the computational requirements, the computational needs for HPC. But I want to close here just with an overview again about logistic regression in the video. Um, it's a very interesting video and captures the essence of logistic regression. Hey guys, and welcome to yet another fun and easy machine learning tutorial on logistic regression. To explain the concept of logistic regression, let's imagine that we want to classify whether a Pokemon will win a battle against another Pokemon. How would we classify this? Well, we could look at a set of features such as hit points, size of the Pokemon, attack rating, and defense rating. Now intuitively, if your Pokemon has insanely high hit points, it would take ages for the opponent Pokemon to destroy yours, assuming the rest of the features are the same for both Pokemon. The same goes for size, attack and defense of a Pokemon. So we can represent this using the equation below, where x is your features, b also denoted as theta are your coefficients. Now if we just take two features such as hit points versus size of a Pokemon, we can use an algorithm such as linear regression and threshold the output. But what if we had an anomaly where the size of a Pokemon wins even though it has low hit points and is small in size? This would lead to misclassification. Also another problem with linear regression is that it also gives values larger than 1 and less than 0. And this is where logistic regression comes in. Looking at the background of logistic regression, so logistic regression is another technique borrowed by machine learning from the field of statistics. It is a go-to method for classification problems, despite the name logistic regression. It is not another algorithm for regression. Logistic regression is but similar to linear regression 
in a sense that they both have the same goal of estimating the values of parameters coefficients. So at the end of the training of the machine learning model, we got the function that best describes the relationship between the known input and the output values. Unlike linear regression, the prediction of the output is transformed using a non-linear function called the logistic function. Some variations of this name are called the sigmoid function as well as the logit function. The logistic function, also called the sigmoid function, was developed by a statistician to describe the properties of the population growth in an ecology rising quickly and maxing out at the carrying capacity of the environment. This is an S-shape curved that can take any real valued number and map it into a value between 0 and 1, but never exactly at those limits, also known as asymptotes. Looking at the logistic regression equations, so the logistic regression hypothesis is defined as h theta of x, which is a function of g theta transpose x, where function g is the sigmoid function, which is defined as g of x equals 1 over 1 plus e to the power negative z. Okay, so back to our Pokemon example. If we take the hit points as x1 and the size of the Pokemon as x2 for now, we plot our data as shown over here, where x's show wins and zeros show losses. We can draw a clear line, also known as the decision boundary, which separates the wins from the losses. From this, we can estimate or predict with high certainty whether a Pokemon with a certain size or hit point values will win or lose. You may note that the gradient is quite similar to linear regression gradient. The difference is actually because Linear and logistic regressions have different definitions of h fix. So the nice thing about logistic regression is that it can be used to fit complex non-linear datasets, which means we can build more complex decision boundaries by fitting complex parameters by using higher order polynomials. So how do we go about finding the coefficients of the logistic function? Well, we can estimate the values of the coefficients using stochastic gradient descent. We'll learn a little bit more about gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent in a future lecture. This is a simple procedure that can be used by many algorithms in machine learning. It works by using the model to calculate a prediction for each instance in the training set and calculate the error for the prediction. We can apply stochastic gradient descent to the problem of finding the coefficients for the logistic regression model as follows. So given a training instance, Number one, calculate the prediction using the current values of the coefficients. And two, calculate new coefficient values based on the error in the prediction. The process is repeated until the model is accurate enough. For example, the error drops to some desirable level also referred to as minimizing the cost function or for a fixed number of iterations. So you continue to update the model for the training instance and correcting errors until the model is accurate enough or cannot be made any more accurate. It is often a good idea to randomize the order of the training instance shown to the model to mix up the corrections made. By updating the model for each training pattern, we call this online learning. It is also possible to collect up all the changes to the model over the training instance and make up one large update. This variation is called batch learning. A little bit more on that in a later lecture. If you look at the applications of logistic regression, number one is image segmentation and categorization, two, geographic image processing, three, handwriting recognition, and four, we can use it for healthcare, where we analyze a group of over a million people for myocardial infarction within a period of 10 years is an application of logistic regression. We can use it for prediction whether a person is depressed or not, based on a bag of words from a corpus seems to be conveniently solvable using logistic regression as well as support vector machines, or SVM. The reason logistic regression is widely used, despite the fact of state-of-the-art algorithms such as deep neural networks, is because logistic regression is very efficient and does not require too much computational resources, which makes it affordable to run on production. Yes, your server won't crash. If you look at logistic regression compared to decision tree, so both algorithms are really fast, and there isn't much to distinguish them in terms of runtime. Logistic regression, however, will work better if there's a single decision boundary, not necessarily parallel to the axis. 
Decision trees can be applied to situations where there's not just one underlying decision boundary but many and will work best if the class labels roughly lie in a hyper-rectangular region. Logistic regressions is intrinsically simple, just low variance and so is less prone to overfitting. Decision trees can be scaled up to be very complex and are more liable to overfitting. Pruning is applied to avoid this. Okay, so that is it. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Click that bell icon to get notified of more fun and easy machine learning algorithms. Also, animating these videos takes a lot of coffee, so I'll be really happy if you could support us on Patreon. Following lecture, we'll learn how to apply a simple logistic regression in Python. So, see you in the next lecture. Thank you for watching. Okay, so that was basically the first part of the lecture. You got a very good introduction in logistic regression. It is still today, given deep learning and deep neural networks and so on, still very much used today, although it's a relatively simple model and still has all the essence in it why basically also deep learning is successful. The capturing the nonlinearity with the uh, logistic function or the sigmoid function, as you have learned, is one part of this, is activation functions that we will learn in subsequent lectures. So we close here with the first part, and then we will do in the next part of this lecture much more review on where are the computing needs, where is parallel computing and machine learning, why parallel computing can help so much in machine learning these days, and also in deep learning.